Father, we ask that you would ready our hearts to honor your presence here now and to honor your word that will be proclaimed. Ready our ears so that we truly hear. Ready our eyes that we can see and behold the beauty and the wonder of all that you are revealed through your precious word. And ready our hearts to not only receive your word, but to obey it and let your spirit do a transformational work in the depths of our beings today. So that the response of your people would be one of great delight and honor and worship and joy. We thank you that you are a God who came into this world to save sinners such as us. And so we join with the saints who have gone before us crying out Hosanna in the highest. Declaring that you alone save and that there's no other name in heaven and earth. by which men and women and children can be saved except through the matchless name of Jesus Christ. So we behold the beauty of the Lamb today. We honor the name of Jesus today. We put our trust in the person of Jesus today. And God, I ask for your filling, your strength, your anointing. Holy Spirit, fill me now. Empower me and preach through me. turn our mourning into dancing and let our minds, our hearts, our whole bodies be an offering of praise back to you. So at this time, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sights. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And it is in your precious son's name we pray. Amen. You know, prayer is something that I've been uh, very consciously aware of in terms of seeking to uh, train up Enoch uh, from a young age to be engaged with. Uh, and I didn't really realize uh, until he was about a year and a half that I needed to be more intentional about praying with him. Uh, even though, I, of course, I covered him in prayer when he was uh, in his mom's womb. I covered him in prayer uh, every day after he was born. But it wasn't until he was about a year and a half that something happened uh, that I want to show you a video clip of in a moment uh, that made me realize that I have to be aware uh, that he is aware of what is going on even when we pray. So if you could cue the video right now, and I want to show you what happened when he was about a year and a half. Nourishing, strengthening, and keeping good health. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. So this is when we traveled to the U.S. Uh, when he was about a year and a half old. And I strongly encourage all parents and future parents, never travel internationally on an airplane with a child that is a year and a half years old. Uh, that was one of the most difficult hours of my life. 
Um, but uh, what happened is from the airport in Incheon until we got to the U.S., whenever we would pray for our meals, he started doing that. He started to mimic praying together. And that's when it kind of dawned on me that, oh my goodness, this person actually is very perceptive of what's going on even in the place of prayer. And so from that time forward, uh, we became a lot more intentional about making sure that he is praying with us and not simply us praying for him. Uh, you know, I shared also before how he uh, likes to pretend like it's mealtime with his stuffed animals, and he will ask me to pray for the meals, and then he'll eat for a couple of seconds, and then he'll pray again, and we'll eat for a couple of seconds and pray again. So uh, the new thing that that's evolved into now is when he gathers his toys and stuffed animals and cars together is he wants me to pray for his toys. And so he will give me a stuffed animal and tell me, pray, Gido, pray for my stuffed animal. And so I'll pray for them. Uh, and he'll give me his cars. And so I pray, but I realize, again, I want to be very uh, effective in my praying. So when he gives me one of his cars, I'll pray for his future travels so that whenever he is in a car, he'll be protected. And he'll give me his pillow, and then I pray for his time of sleep. And then he'll call out different people that he knows, uh, like grandma or auntie and uncle, and so we pray for them. Uh, so I'm really thankful that uh, this is being incorporated into his life from a young age. Uh, but as I was reflecting upon this, I, also, I was also reflecting upon how in the Western world, there are very peculiar ways that we teach children how to pray. In fact, uh, it's almost disturbing when you realize what's really going on. Uh, for example, you may have learned this prayer as a child if you grew up in the Western cultures. Uh, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Now, if you really think about what they're saying, that's very strange. Uh, God, I'm going to go to sleep now, but if I die right now in my sleep, take my soul, okay? Um, you know, and then we leave the child, okay? So we pray, right? So go to sleep, good night, don't let the bed bugs bite. And now we're freaking them out some more, like bed bugs. So I might die, and now you're talking about bed bugs, and so now the child's awake. Uh, so, okay, you're, oh, you're still awake, let me sing you a lullaby. rock a baby, on the treetop. Okay, so think about what we're really saying. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bough breaks, when the branch breaks, the cradle will fall. And down will come, baby, cradle and all. How is that supposed to comfort anybody? It's no wonder why kids grow up with nightmares when we're young, right? Very strange. And I think the people who came up with these prayers and lullabies were very evil. You know, um, very dark and disturbing things that they're saying. So we've got to create some new prayers and lullabies for our babies. Because true prayer is to bring about peace from God, not fear from these prayers and lullabies. And so it is something that we want to incorporate from the, child that, from the time that children are young, but not just when they are young. It is, prayer is of such importance, we need to learn to understand its value for all the days of our lives. So that is our final core value that we'll be exploring today. And I want to look at its significance and importance in our lives and our ministries. We're in our final week of this series that we've been going through for the past 10 plus weeks on our core values. And we are heading into Passion Week this week as we remember the sufferings of Christ, his death on Good Friday, and we get ready to celebrate his res resurrection next Sunday for Easter and Resurrection Sunday. So we encourage you next Sunday uh, to bring loved ones that have yet to know Christ as their Lord and Savior so that they might hear the gospel and simply through an invitation, uh, who knows what God can do to bring them into the family of faith and join us in heaven one day. But for today, uh, we want to look at the f uh, final core value and especially the value that we will place on prayer. But to review, let's look at the other core values that we've been exploring so far for our ministry. And the first core value is this. We value Christ and his gospel as everything. That the preeminence person and uh, foundation of our whole life, being, ministry, all that we do, 
uh, stems from the person of Jesus Christ and the gospel that he came to proclaim and to make a reality for our lives. Also, we value opportunities to honor the presence of God. We want to be a people who live in the presence of God, a people who honor his sacred presence that is always surrounding his people. We value reaching the unreached to finish the mission, uh, unreached missions of bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth, to unreached people groups and untargeted people groups of this planet. That is our priority so that we can finish the Great Commission and we can finally see the return of Christ and go home. We also value excellence in all things, that we want to give God our best as an expression of love and worship, for he is worthy of our best. Also, we value viewing the vulnerable as valuable to God. This is the core value from which all of our justice ministry arises from, that to God's heart and in his kingdom, people who are vulnerable are deeply valuable, and we want to place a high value in ministering to them as well. We value aligning all things with Scripture because that is the source from which all truth comes from. We value love as the motive of all things, because as 1 Corinthians 13 teaches us, without love, everything else that we do is in vain. We value using our gifts to bless the body of Christ. And last week, we looked at the value of enjoying life together in community. And today, our final value that we'll look at is we value saturating all things in prayer. So please repeat after me. We value saturating all things in prayer. So that's what we want to explore today, the role and the value that we place of being a people and a community of prayer and to saturate our lives and all things in prayer as well. So open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We'll be looking at verses 9 to 13 as we explore this core value for us together. Follow along with me also in your outlines. So why do we value saturating all things in prayer? Because it is through prayer that we remember our position. So everyone repeat, we remember our position. What Jesus teaches us is that one of the primary functions of prayer is to remind us of the position that we have in Christ. Let's look at Matthew 6, verse 9. Pray then like this, Jesus teaches in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, the incredible revelation that Jesus gives uh, gives to us about learning how to pray is to remember that our new position we have through the sacrifice of Christ uh, is also found in the adoption of the Father in heaven. So the beginning of Jesus' school of prayer, his theology of prayer begins with a theology of adoption. This shows us that prayer is not pleading to an uncaring God. It's not begging a God who does not care for us. Prayer is not negotiating with God, saying, God, uh, give me this and I'll do this. Prayer is not putting God in our debt, saying, God, I've been waking up early to pray to you. I've been going to a morning prayer at church for 40 days, so now you owe me what I've been praying for. That is not prayer either. True Christian prayer begins with knowing that I am praying to my Father who adopted me, who chose me, and who loves me. Prayer must begin by remembering that I am a child of the Father, and my Father rules the world. You see, this positioning is a reminder of why God even hears our prayers. You see, there's a lot of unbiblical, non-Christian praying that happens even in the church. You see, non-Christian praying thinks prayers are payments. And the more we pray, the more God will be happy with what we're doing, and then God will answer my prayers. But for the Christian... We pray and God hears because of who I am and because of whose I am. Because of who I am in Christ and because whose I am, I belong to the Father in heaven and because of what Jesus has done for me to make that relationship possible. That is why God hears our prayers. 
prayers. It is not because of how much we pray or how long we pray that God hears or answers prayers. You see, our prayers are heard because of the position we have as children of God that was made possible through the sacrifice of Christ. This is foundational and crucial to know in order to pray biblically, in order to pray properly, and in order to pray with faith. You see, our position determines our petition. Okay, so our position, our relationship with God, determines our petition, what we can ask him for. The depth of intimacy you have with someone determines the depth of which you can ask someone something. For example, if you just bump into a stranger at a restaurant, there aren't too many things that you could really ask them. Uh, again, your position, relationship, determines your petition, what you can ask. So with strangers, you can't ask for too many things. Uh, you might be able to ask for the time. Excuse me, we've never met, but do you have the time? Uh, I don't have my watch on me. And so that would be understandable and acceptable. Oh, sure, let, no, it's 4 o'clock. And you might be able to ask a stranger for directions. Excuse me, I'm not familiar with this area. If you're from this area, can you please help me find the address that I'm looking for? It's around here somewhere. Uh, so that's about it for strangers. But if you're in that restaurant, you can't ask a stranger, oh my goodness, my food is taking so long. Can I have a bite of that sandwich that you're eating? I am so hungry, and man, those, you have so many fries. Can I have some fries? You can't do that to a stranger. And you cannot say to a stranger, you know, I, I, I don't have a lot of money. I don't have cash on me. Can I borrow 10 bucks? I promise I'll pay you back the next time I see you. <laughs> but if you're with friends, with some friends, right, most friends, you can ask for a bite of their sandwich. You can ask for some fries, and you may also be able to ask for uh, $10 to borrow and to pay them back the next time you see them. And I say most friends because I do know of some people who don't like it when you take their fries or take a bite out of their food. So most friends will do that. Uh, so again, the relationship is now closer, and so it broadens... The, the options of what I can ask of them. But if you're f with family in that same restaurant, you don't have to ask for the fries, you just take them, right? You don't have to ask to borrow $10, especially if you're eating with your dad, your dad's going to pay for it. You don't flip the bill. That's the joy of eating with family because that is the closest relationship and it broadens the options even further of what you are able to do, what you are able to say, and what you can really expect out of that relationship. You see, that's also the joy of prayer. Because in prayer, we are with family. And you are talking to your Father in heaven. And that position is why God hears your prayers. And that position is why God answers prayers. Amen? So this is foundational to understand and to make sure that you are praying Christian prayers, not unbiblical, non-Christian prayers. And it is also from that position as God's child, we learn to rest in his presence, rest in his peace, and as you pray, you learn to trust him with everything. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So he says, don't worry about anything. Don't be anxious. Don't meditate on problems, because that's really what we do when we worry. We all know how to meditate, because that's what we do when we, we meditate on problems. Right? That's what worry is. He says, don't meditate on problems, don't worry, but learn to surrender those problems to the Lord and trust Him with these things. Give God all of your concerns and learn to rest your worries in prayer because your Father will hear you 
He will carry you, and he will trade your problems for peace as you learn to trust him through all trials of our lives. And it is your position as a child in the arms of a father that will bring about true peace for your soul. That is why we pray, and that is why we value saturating all things in prayer. It begins with knowing who we are and whose we are, and we belong to him. Amen? That is foundational because not all believers pray with this foundation. But that's not all. Another reason why we value prayer is because it is through prayer that we fulfill his plans. So everyone repeat, we fulfill his plans. Matthew chapter 6 verse 10 says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus teaches us to pray for his kingdom to come, his will to be done on this planet in our lives as it is meant to be. Uh, just as it is in heaven. So he teaches us to pray for the plans of God to be realized and fulfilled within our lives. We must pray for his kingdom and come. Pray for his will to be done in Korea, in Ukraine, in our lives as it is in heaven. So our fire by night, which is our monthly prayer walks that we do in different strategic places throughout Korea, those prayers, and the reason why we started this several years ago is because those are earth-shaking, nation-transforming kingdom prayers that bring about his kingdom and his will to be done within key places in Korea that need the prayers of the church. Amen? And that is why we do these prayer walks into the city and that is why we select these strategic places. So when we have done prayer walks in different red light districts, and we have done some prayer walks and we've prayed for them to shut down, God has answered some of those prayers, and we thank the Lord for that. When we pray around some of these medical clinics that we know that do abortions, even though they are illegal, and we pray against abortions, and we pray for the protection and the honoring of sacred life in this uh, nation, those are kingdom prayers, and that is praying his will into this nation. And this month's Fire by Night, which will take place not this Friday, but next Friday uh, on the 25th, will be at the center that cares for uh, children of victims of sexual abuse. And unfortunately, that's the only center that provides this kind of care and counseling. And so we want to be a people, uh, a church that lives beyond the four walls of a building and not just on Sundays. We want to go to these kind of places and pray that God's will, his kingdom, healing, salvation, restoration would be thick in these centers. So that as these children who have experienced a taste of hell through the abuse would encounter a taste of heaven through the power of prayer as his church pours kingdom prayers into places that need his will to be done. Amen? And so I encourage you guys to be a part of these fire by night prayer walks that we do. You see, there's power in prayer because prayers fulfill kingdom purposes of God here on this earth. Prayer is one of the most powerful things on this planet because prayer connects us to the most powerful person in all the universe. And answers to prayers are just a small glimpse of the power that is released from heaven here on earth. You know, we've been praying for the Korean congregation of Omidy Church to rise up for justice for the past three years. And this year, those prayers, those three years of praying was answered as they began their justice ministry. I was able to preach for their leaders meeting last Monday night, and it was such a blessing to see about 60 or 70 leaders elders, pastors, and lay leaders uh, praying and planning together for their pursuit of justice in Korea. And I want to ask you to continue to pray for Onidi Church at large, for the whole church, for the Korean congregation, for the Japanese congregation, for the Chinese congregation, for the Russian congregation. We have so many ethnic groups that worship in this church, and we want to be a church that pursues the things of God's heart in the place of justice and righteousness as well. So please continue to pray for this church. Amen? 
I also want to ask for your prayers concerning Holt Children's Services, which is one of the orphanages that we are in partnership with. If you did not hear um, recently, a three-year-old child that was adopted from Holt Korea into the United States uh, was, um, was found dead, and the adoptive father is accused of killing him. Now, the trial is still ongoing. We still do not know what really happened, but as a result... The anti-adoption groups and even parts of the Korean government, they are dragging Holt Korea in the mud right now, and they need our prayers uh, for protection, uh, and especially for the orphans, uh, because this uh, case has slowed down even further the international adoptions that we're in process right now. So we really need to be in prayer for this issue. And so I ask for your prayers. Also, of course, as I shared last week, we have to continue to pray for God's healing and his will to be done for the life of Eric, who is the 10-year-old son, 10-year-old son of a couple of our missionaries who did a lot of great work in Asia for many years, uh, who was just discovered to have leukemia last week, and he's going through chemo treatment in the United States right now. And so we need to keep Eric in prayer as well. And so God asks us to pray for the sick, and to pray for healing because only he can heal. God may use, by his grace, medicine to bring about healing. He may use surgeries or treatments, but healing alone comes from God. And so that is why we need to ask the source of all healing to release healing, be it through divine, miraculous intervention or through other gracious means. We are to pray for healing and for his will to be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So pray for his will to be fully realized within our lives. You see, God has ordained prayer to be the means through which his will is done, but also prayer is God's will being done. Prayer not only brings about his plans and his purposes into the world, that things happen that would not have happened if we did not pray. God has ordained prayer to be the means through which his purposes are accomplished. But also, not only is prayer how God's will gets done, prayer is his will being done. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 18, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Rejoicing in the Lord is fulfilling God's will for your life. Giving thanks in all circumstances is God's will being done in our lives. And praying without ceasing is God's will being done within our lives. But you see, in order to really learn how to pray, we have to pray. And that's a very peculiar thing. That in order to really grow in prayer, in order to learn how to pray, the best way is to pray. It's a lot like swimming. You could learn about swimming by watching it on TV, by watching people swim, by reading about it, by studying the physics of water and arm strength. But you don't really learn how to swim until you get in the water and try to swim. And the same is true with prayer. You could read about prayer, hear about prayer, be inspired about prayer, but you can't really navigate and grow in this place of prayer until you actually attempt to pray. And so that's why we encourage you to find places to pray and to develop prayer and to increase prayer. And that's why we've turned our Wednesday night service into OEM night of prayer to give you another opportunity and another place for you to be surrounded in a place where people will be praying for the city, for the church, for the nations, so that in that place, in that pool of praying water, you can learn how to swim and navigate and grow as an intercessor. So what we've been doing throughout uh, the past uh, series for Wednesday, uh, our night of prayer, is the hour that changes the world teaching you 12 different ways to pray. And if you learn to pray these ways just five minutes 
each different type of prayer uh, that will be an hour. And it's not praying just so that you could pray for an hour, but it's learning to grow and develop your prayer life because God tells us that his house will be called a house of prayer. And so we want to be a place of prayer. We want to be a people of prayer because God's house is a house of prayer. Amen? And so that's why we value it. Uh, but also, we value prayer because through prayer, we receive his provision. So everyone repeat. We receive his provision. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. It says, Give us this day our daily bread. So give us, Lord. Jesus is teaching us to pray and ask God for provision. Not just provision, look to ask for daily provision. The things that we need. God provides through the prayers of his people. Prayer is the means through which he chooses to bring forth his provisions. So as we ask, he provides, he answers. And when he answers, he receives thanks, honor, praise. And James also teaches us that we don't have because we didn't ask God for them. Uh, meaning, sometimes God will wait until we pray, and sometimes God will wait until we pray for a season before he brings about fulfillment to the things that we prayed for. You see, the giver gets the glory, and we need to remember who the giver of all good things is. So we remember who deserves all the glory, and that is Jesus alone. So we believe God answers and pro uh, provides through our prayers. But in light of this, we need to be reminded of, again, the different ways that God answers prayers. Because God will always answer prayers prayers. It may not be the answer that we were waiting for, but he will always answer prayers. We've talked about this in the past, but I want to remind us again, because of this is our core value series, we need to be a people of faith who are able to process through the different ways that God answers prayers. And there are four ways that God will usually answer prayers. The one way is God may say, go, meaning yes. Uh, go for it. It's the right request at the right time, and God will answer yes. God may say go, and sometimes God may say no, that this isn't the best option for you, so you need to trust me in this. That's still an answer. No is not the answer that we usually want, but that is still an answer to prayer sometimes. Other times, God may say slow, meaning not yet. This is not the right time yet. Uh, you know, I was in the subway uh, one Saturday uh, afternoon, and the uh, train was filled with kids and families. It was a beautiful, sunny Saturday afternoon, so a lot of families were going to go to the park and various other places. And one kid in the train car had a balloon. And as you know, uh, kids usually like balloons. And so I heard the, the boy sitting next to me asking his dad, Daddy, uh, can I have a balloon too? Uh, to which his dad said, yes, of course, but... We're heading to the pool now. We're about to swim, so not now, okay, later. To which the child responds like most children do, No, Dad, now! Give it to me now. I want a balloon now! Because he sees the kid playing with the balloon, and it looks so much fun. And so the father had to keep reassuring him, I will give you a balloon, but not now, because we're heading to the pool, and you can't swim with the, you know, with the balloon in the pool, so please, wait, after we swim, I'll get it to you. And so finally the child relented and said, okay, promise? And the father said, of course. You see, we're like that child so often that we may take a delay as something that disturbs us, and we will pout and scream, say, no, I don't want to hear slow. I want to hear a go. And we pout, say, God. And God will say, yes, but not now. But you see, it will take intimacy with God and maturity of faith to discern a no from a slow. Because that child was just mature enough to finally understand when the dad said yes, but not now, for him to be able to accept that answer. If that boy was a little bit younger, a little bit more immature, and unable to fully comprehend what his dad was telling him, he would pout, be angry. 
You see, it takes intimacy and maturity to, of faith to discern no's from slow. So God may say go, yes. God may say no. God may say slow, not yet. But through it all, God will always say grow. Grow in your prayer life. Grow in intimacy with me. Grow in your faith capacity to trust me through every answer of your life. You see, God will always provide through prayer. He will provide the best that you need, but we don't always know what that is. He will provide the best that you need at the best time that you need it. Amen. It takes faith to trust Him. And it is in prayer that our heart of faith will be ready to receive His answer in due time. But also, we value prayer because through prayer, we, we receive his pardon. So everyone repeat. We receive his pardon. Matthew 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So another element of prayer that we need to become fluent in is to pray prayers of confession, prayers of repentance, and prayers of forgiveness. Forgive us, God, our debts as we also have forgiven those who sin against us. So become fluent in your prayer life of praying confession as we confess to God and receive the mercies of God. Because if we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9 tells, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. Become fluent in in praying prayers of repentance, not just saying sorry, though I feel bad for the sin and the mistake or for getting caught. It's changing our minds and our lifestyles as a result, changing the way that we live to crucify the sin, to crucify our flesh in order to follow the crucified Savior. You see, that's another difference between Christian praying and non-Christian praying, even in the church. You see, both Christians and non-Christians may pray prayers that repent of our sins. But true Christians also pray and repent of our righteousness. Knowing that even our most righteous attempts in life are like filthy rags before God that it is only through the work of Christ that can purify us and make us right before God and others. And in prayer, we become fluent in offering forgiveness to others as well. Matthew six twelve, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. You see, he's teaching us to pray and live a lifestyle of receiving grace and giving grace. As you have received his mercies that don't give you the punishment that you deserve, we extend that same mercy to others and we do not punish others even though they deserve it and sinned against us. Prayer is to remind us of the mercies we received to extend mercies to others. And as you receive his grace, unmerited favor, gift, and blessing, and as you receive such goodness that you don't deserve, give goodness to others, though they don't deserve it either. You know, recently, uh, it was in the news, World Vision USA announced that they would lift their ban on sexual orientation as a requirement for employment meaning that they would be open to hiring people who practice homosexuality to work for their company. Now, the response from the evangelical community was quick and it was very harsh. Thousands in the U.S., uh, thousands of child sponsors canceled their sponsorship money as a result of the news. Um, and the next day, uh, World Vision reversed their decision again, uh, to keep their original policies of employment. Now, I'm not here to talk about homosexuality, though it is sin, biblically, uh, but though also it is not the greatest sin, it is not the unforgivable sin, so that's not my issue here of sharing this. But the witness that was harmed by the church 
that said, we will no longer feed those children because of this policy. It did something uh, to the eyes of the world that was looking at the church. And that's what I want to focus on. You see, the witness that was harmed when the world saw Christians taking money and food out of the mouths of children who are hungry because of this news break, it shocked a lot of the unbelieving world. Now, no, some non-believers, they were horrified to learn that thousands of Christians would choose to starve children because of these sins that somebody else committed, not the sins that the children committed, but that somebody else committed. And one of the things that happened as a result is they began looking at the church differently. What they were seeing were judgmental people judging sinners who no longer fed children because of the sins of other people. And so there were groups who petitioned strangers all around the internet to take up sponsorships uh, of these children that these Christians abandoned. Again, I'm not trying to belittle homosexuality, nor am I trying to make that the issue of this story. What I do want to say is this. This issue of homosexuality has triggered something because it is a hot topic in the Western world right now, and it's going to spread throughout the world. It has revealed something from the heart of the evangelical church in terms of how we respond to people who sin because what the world sees from us on this issue now is anger, hatred, judgment, and wrath. That is how the unbelieving world now sees the church. But one of the things that I want to make clear for the church here and globally is this. We need to stop expecting non-believers to act like Christians. Amen? Amen? Because how this kind of exploded is we are expecting Hollywood and governments throughout the world to follow Scripture and to reflect the values of Scripture. Of course, I would love it if that was the case, but they're not believers. And when we expect unbelievers to act like believers, there's going to be a huge disconnect and we need to understand that. So because of this, I'm not sure a lot of people will be drawn to Christ if we continue to respond in this way. Because as Romans reminds us, it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. What prayer should do is remind us that we are sinners forgiven, therefore have softened hearts to extend mercy and grace, for mercy triumphs over judgments. Amen? What the world sees so often from us is judgments, but they need to see, but they need to see in our lives also God's mercy. And Jesus reminds us that prayer is the place to be reminded of his grace in our lives. Jesus paved the way, breaking down the wall of hostility, appeasing God's wrath, and bringing about peace for us in a new way for us to relate to God as Father because we too lived a deeply rebellious and sinful life before Christ. But it is by his mercies and grace we have been changed. And so may we be eager to value the mercies of God in our lives by extending that mercy to others. Amen? And one more crucial reason we value saturating all things in prayer is that through prayer, we receive his protection. So everyone repeat, we receive his protection. Verse 13 of Matthew 6, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us 
from evil. Jesus teaches us that we must pray for protection against temptation, against sin, and against evil. Prayer is a form of protection because prayer can function as a shield in the spiritual realm. That is why Paul asks for prayers of protection from the churches. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 and 2. Finally, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as it happened among you and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men for not all have faith. He prays for effectiveness in ministry and he prays for protection from evil because he knows the power prayer has to protect those prayed for. And that is why I need your prayers. And that is why for our next series after Easter and probably one Sunday also, there might be a one-off sermon, uh, we're going to start a new series on praying for your pastors. Uh, because this year, I have to be honest with you, has been spiritually one of the most intense years of warfare. I knew this core values series, I was going to head into a lot of warfare uh, because the enemy does not want to see this church's culture change from apathy to affection for God, of non-committal to committed people for God. Um, I knew we were going to head into a lot of warfare, uh, but I did not expect this level of bombardment that I felt in the spiritual realm. And also I knew there was going to be a lot of warfare uh, because this month, and actually today, my book Justice Awakening got released on the Kindle edition at least, and then later this month the physical uh, book will be released. I knew there was going to be a lot of warfare because that book was going to be out for the church to be equipped with. Uh, but I, I need to tell you, I've been facing a lot of spiritual warfare this year, uh, more than in previous years. And so um, I need your prayers. And it is really more out of desperation I'm going to be doing this series more than anything else. Uh, because if you have not been praying for me regularly, if not daily, I need you to begin doing this. Um, I am fighting for us. I'm fighting for change in this country. I'm fighting for change in this church uh, in ways that will bring God more honor. And there's a lot of warfare in these changes that we are pursuing. Um, so I need your prayers of protection as well. I'll be speaking at a conference at the end of this month in Chicago called Justice for Korea uh, at Willow Creek Church. And that too, uh, as we release the church to be engaged in justice, I need your prayers for that too. Amen. This is a true story I heard from a Christian author in the U.S. that tells about his prayer life at home. Uh, he and his wife would pray for their children before they would go to sleep every night. Uh, and even when their children grew up and left home and went to college, they still committed to praying for their children. He and his wife uh, one night were out late at a friend's house for dinner, and they both went into bed exhausted, ready to go to sleep, when his wife said, we forgot to pray for our daughters, let's pray for them. He was so tired and tempted to just skip it. Uh, but she felt something strange and said, no, we need to pray for our kids right now. And so they did. Now, their kids, again, are in college by this time. Uh, and so they don't see them as often or hear from them as often. But the next day, one of their daughters called and spoke with their mom. And she tells her mom that last night, she also was out eating late with a friend in their car when someone tried to break into their car. But thankfully, thankfully the door was locked. And they sounded the horn, and this man fled away. Soon thereafter, a police car drove by, and the, this daughter uh, you know, stopped the police car and tell, telling the police officer ju what just happened. The police officer asked to describe the man, and when she described him, he said, that's who we're looking for right now because he just escaped from prison. Uh, and when her mom asked the daughter what time all this happened, it was the exact same time that they were praying for their children. Then they realized why God had prompted them uh, to pray last night, and they were also reminded of the power of prayer to protect those prayed for. You see, there is power in prayer, and that is why we value it, and that is why we need to saturate all things with it. You know, though we've been using the term saturating all things in prayer, like it's covering things prayed for, that is true. But also what is true is that when we pray, we too are covered with the presence of God, with the grace of God 
in our lives. You know, one of the things that Enoch does too these days is he likes to collect little rocks and pebbles when he goes to the park and he'll bring them home in his pocket. I did that too growing up. And so my heart really melted when he, for the first time, would unload all of these rocks and say, look, you know, they're still with dirt covered in them too. And uh, I was so touched because I remember when I collected rocks as a little kid. Um, But my favorite rocks that I collected when I was young were smooth rocks from the beaches. As you know, rocks are not normally smooth. They are rough. They have sharp edges. But if they are near bodies of water, they become smooth as the waves wash over them, wave after wave, covered and covered again. In time, these rough edges turn smooth. And I realize that I think that's a picture of prayer as well. Because we have a lot of rough edges. I have a lot of rough edges. We cut others with our sharp tongues. But as we learn to come into the presence of God with all of our rough edges, with all of our sins, with all of our anxieties and worries, and learn to bring it before the foot of the cross and bring it before the lap of our Father in heaven, something happens in the place of prayer. He covers over us with waves of grace, wave after wave of grace, so that slowly but surely he smooths out the rugged children so that more and more the anxieties turn into peace. The sins are forgiven. Our rough edges get smoothed over by grace. You see, prayers are powerful because prayers not only change our situations, prayers will ultimately change us. All things change through prayer. Prayer changes us to be who we were meant to be. A child sitting, a child asking, a child receiving, a child trusting, a child changing, a child in the arms of our Father. That is true prayer. Amen. Let's pray.